Uh, Rena Priest is a member of the Lummi Nation and is the author of Patriarchy Blues, which was honored with the 2018 American Book Award and the recent Sublime Subliminal. She has also received the Allied Arts Foundation 2020 Professional Poets Award and residency fellowships from Hawthorne Castle, Hedgebrook, and Mineral School. She is a National Graphic Explorer and a 2019 Jack Straw writer. Priest's work can be found in Poetry Northwest, Pontoon Poetry, Verse Daily, Poem a Day at Poets.org, and elsewhere. She has taught at Western Washington University and Northwest Indian College. Priest holds a BA in English from Western Washington University and an MFA in writing from Sarah Lawrence College. She lives in Bellingham, Washington. Welcome, Rena. Thank you. Ms. Nat Chochlamison. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. I'm gonna go ahead and just start. I'll read some poems and then open it up for a Q and A. Um, this first poem is called Resonance and it has an epigraph by Anaxagoras. It says, all things were together, the mind came and arranged them. The flicker of a wave on the sea is a flame, not like a candle on a cake, keeping tally of our days. Instead, the fire measures life together by the sweetness of resonance. How exalted by the dawn, we as one have sung our true song, become a single voice across the waves. The wax of a candle begins inside the humming darkness of a hive, but before that it begins as sunlight, calling forth blossoms, pollen, and bees. Bees who play matchmaker to trees, calling forth fruit to become new seeds. Where does love begin? It is surprising, but obvious and easy, like breathing. It has been there all along, a flicker on the sea that swam up from the deep to touch air and light, to shine like fire, leap from its element the way a tree becomes a boat so the earth can leap into the sea and sail toward adventure. Things are changed, things transform. This is the way the mind arranged it. The mind comes and arranges, the heart draws it all back toward union washes away the illusion of our separateness, gives new measures for happiness, a new way to celebrate the state of being of one heart and one mind, Ait Hutchning, our song is a ferry that joins two shores. So the uh, concept of Ait Hutchning is, uh, it's a lummy term. It translates directly to good feelings, but um, more, appropriately, it talks about um, the state of your heart and your mind being in resonance, there being no conflict between what you think and what you feel, and that <clears throat> um, that's, a, that's a good feeling. <laughs> and when you're in that state, and you're in that state with the others around you, there's no conflict between the hearts and minds of those who you're um, in community with, then it's a sense of resonance and it's a good way to make decisions. And the elders tell us that you should be in that state of light hutching before you make decisions together. And so um, just a little bit of background on that. There's also a line in this poem that talks about a canoe leaping, a tree leaping into the sea to become a canoe to sail off towards adventure. And that speaks to the belief that when a tree became a canoe, it didn't stop living its life. It entered into a new state of life, the way that a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Um, so it chose the family to spend out the next part of its life with as a canoe. And so canoes um, are very, very significant and sacred in our culture. And <clears throat> um, so during the era when it was illegal for indigenous fishers to be on the water, the confiscation of canoes was much more than simply a confiscation of gear. It was a, a life way and a life force that was removed from the family. Um, so anyway, there's that. Um, I know that this is a 
a symposium focused on marine research. And it seems maybe on the surface a little bit strange to read a poem about trees. But as you know, trees are so significant to uh, the salmon population when they return to their natal streams. It has to be nice and cold. And trees really help with that process. Um, and right now on the upper red sats, um, Washington State is um, considering issuing a license um, to log a section of the upper red sats that has trees that are uh, older than 150 years old. It's second growth and it's um, it's it's a very kind of unique uh, ecosystem. And so if you want to look into that, <clears throat> follow up with me and I can give you some more information. But for now, here's more poems. <laughs> the forest for the trees. I have seen a tree split in two from the opposing weight of its branches. It can survive though its heart is exposed. I have seen a country do this too. I have heard an elder say that we must be like the willow, bend not to break. I have made peace this way. My neighbors clear cut their trees, leaving mine defenseless. The arborist said they'd fall in the first strong wind. Together we stand. I see this now. I have seen a tree grown around a bicycle, a street sign, and a chainsaw absorbing them like ingredients in a great melting pot. When we speak, whether or not we agree, the trees will turn the breath of our words from carbon dioxide back into air. Give us new breath for new words, new chances to listen, new chances to be heard. So that poem I wrote for um, Spark Magazine, which is the magazine of Humanities Washington, and the topic that they gave me, the theme of that issue was discourse in democracy. And uh, for some reason, it just went straight to trees. And I think maybe because uh, we don't have democracy, we don't have trees. <laughs> um, so this next poem is called, A Poem is a Naming Ceremony. What has grown out of what has gone away? The clear-cut patch has grown larger on the mountain. The rivers have grown murky with timber trash. And there's enough runoff cow manure to grow corn out there on the tide flats. I don't want to think about what has gone away. I want to meander and play and forget myself until I can grow a new me in place of all this grief. Learn the language to see the cottonwood as quiolich each, the dancing tree, the killer whales as quilhomichin, our relatives under the sea, the whole glorious landscape filled with meaning to end my grieving. When I was young, I was invited to learn Kulnukkin, the people's language, but I said no, I didn't understand. I thought I wanted to learn to be rich. I didn't know the only way to possess all the wealth of the world is by naming it. Here is bird song. Here is the kiss of a lover. Here is the feel of cold water at the peak of summer. I have spent my life with words trying to name a hint of what I lost by not learning my language. Estetimsen, tutatistsen, estetimsen. So those last three words in that poem, um, it translates to, uh, <laughs> I'm doing my best, I'm still learning, I'm doing my best. Um, and, you know, going on this, this journey towards trying to learn my tribal language, it's uh, really been eye-opening to me. Um, you really do see things in a different way when you have different language to name to name things. For example, the cottonwood, to see it as its own independent being having a, a purpose and for existence independent of human uses and needs. Um, if you call something a cottonwood, you're breaking it down to like it's commodities, it's wood, you use it, it's a dead thing. You build things with it and you burn it. Um, but it's not a living, it's not a life force of its own. But if you call it the quiolage each, the dancing tree, it 
identifies itself as a tree that dances. It has innate value just in its being um, independent of our uses. And so, you know, it creates a different type of relating to the world and a different type of um, understanding wealth. If you think about a dancing tree, the cottonwood, in the sunshine, in the breeze, uh, you know, you see its leaves and it has leaves that have silver on the bottom and green on top and they shimmy in the wind and it's just really beautiful and to um, be able to bear witness to that beauty is to have a different type of um, a set of different set of values I think so well, that's a little bit about that poem <laughs> and this one is called Remembering Sila at Shwilisen. We used to say when the tide is out the table is set the earth provided, and if one day it didn't, the spirit fed us, the glittering turn of the tide, the arc of the sun in the sky, the call of birds, the sound of waves. To be nourished in this way makes glass doors opening and closing themselves between me and that food on grocery store shelves seem false, empty. That food, where does it come from? Whose hands grew it? Was there patience and care? Were there prayers? Think of how it got there, what it's made of. When I was a girl, everything we ate came from the earth that loved us through the hands of people we loved. And so that speaks a little bit to um, that saying, when the tide is out, the table is set, which is, it was true for, for a very, very long time, for hundreds of generations. And um, now it's difficult to harvest shellfish in our usual and accustomed areas primarily because of the runoff from um, Ferndale, the cow manure. Um, it, it causes algae blooms and it makes the shellfish toxic. It makes the shellfish toxic. So uh, that is no longer a true saying, something that has been true for thousands and thousands of years is not any longer. Um, so Will you excuse me for a minute? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to be sniffling at you all. <laughs> Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I just drank um, miso, a nice hot cup of miso soup. And so <laughs> I got the sniffles. Um, I apologize. Um, Keep going. This is beautiful. Thank you. Wonderful. So this next poem is called Remembering Tata at Tampixen, which is a place name. I forgot to mention. So the title of the previous poem, Remembering Sila at Shvalisen, talks about um, Sila is the name for grandmother and Shwilisen is the name, it's a traditional place name for um, the land bridge that arises at low tide where we went to harvest, harvest shellfish. So this is Remembering Tata at Tamhuixen. A glossary of bell related words, chimes, sings, peals, tolls. It is a feeling of silver. It rings and shines at the edges. Like the scales of a fish, it flickers, tintinabulates, the signal of a charm, of magic, of a movie memory sequence. And then there is mother, home from the cannery, covered in the scales of hundreds of gutted fish. She shimmers like a mermaid. Long day, I ask. When I lunch at noon, she replies, the sky is a polished silver spoon. By quitting time, tarnish has overtaken all signs of shine. That's how long the day is. You must have cleaned a lot of fish, I say. I think we cleaned out all of Puget Sound. There used to be gooseberries at Gooseberry Point. Now there is the cannery. Won't be long before all the fish are gone. Then the cannery will go and all will have is hunger and sorrow. A burden is the heaviest bell of a carillon. Its register is low. I wish I had a magic wand to chime the cheerful sound of gooseberries sprouting up out of the ground. Um, so Tamhuixen is the place name for Gooseberry Point. There used to be gooseberries there. <laughs> um, and Tata is the affectionate name for mother. 
Um, so in 1903, the largest salmon cannery in the world, Pacific American Fisheries Plant, was operated in Bellingham and on Clackamish homelands. And it's estimated that 90% of salmon caught in the Puget Sound were caught within 20 miles of the cannery. So that is, you know, the, the Lummi food supply that sustained us again for thousands and thousands of, of years. Um, there are reef net anchors dating back over 10,000 years. Um, so, you know, we've been here relying on the salmon fishery for a long time and it was very abundant um, prior to the canneries. And so we know that we were here for a long time relying on the fishery in a sustainable way. Um, so I think, you know, maybe kind of looking back to see what, how, that, how that worked might benefit us and the salmon. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's that poem and I'll move on here. It just also speaks to the way that, um, so when the cannery came along, that, and, and it became, you know, the fish became marketable like outside of the region, and it was seen as like a very profitable industry, then it, it, that, that's when it became illegal for indigenous fishers to be on the water and practicing you know, our traditional life ways. And so generations of women in my family went to work in the canneries um, and it was hard work, it was cold, it was unpleasant, <laughs> um, long hours and low wages. So it, the canneries drastically changed the life ways in this region. Oh, wow, something, something fell out in the living room. <laughs> okay. This next poem is a found poem and it's from Lummi Elders Speak and it's my great grandmother, Sadie Celestine Jones. She says, when I was a little girl, they wouldn't allow any Indian dancing. My granddad was an Indian dancer. They used to have a smokehouse and they Indian danced down at Gooseberry Point. They had a big powwow house at Gooseberry. Then they had another one over here at Smokehouse Road. I remember when I was small, we used to go down to Gooseberry Point, like on Treaty Day, on January 22nd. It would start in the morning and they would have sometimes white speakers come in and talk. The Indians talked also to tell about their rights. Then they'd have their games. It was an all day occasion. A lot of eating, then in the evenings, they'd Indian dance. So she's talking here about um, how in her parents' generation, well, and, and her generation also, actually several generations, um, it was illegal to practice our spiritual traditions, which celebrate and honor um, the, the life force all around us, the other living things on which we relied, um, our songs and our dances um, really carried our values and our, um, so in some ways our technology, right? It's a technology to be able to sustain an ecosystem in a thriving way. And our belief systems were what guided that. And to have those made illegal, I think was a real detriment to those ecosystems as well as um, the people um, to be outlawed from singing and dancing um, for, for so long. In fact, it didn't become legal again until 1978. August 11th, 1978, when Jimmy Carter signed into law the American Indian Religious Freedoms Act. So um, I wasn't born yet, but I was technically on the planet. Um, <laughs> this was six months before I was born. Um, so, you know, it was in many of our lifetimes that it finally became legal again for Indians to sing and dance. Um, so this next poem is called Silence from the Deep. How do we mistake desolation for peace? When orcas no longer sing, will we grieve? Waves say hush along the beach. Under the waves, there is no reprieve. When orcas no longer sing, will we grieve? Each generation dwindles in number. 
Under the waves, there is no reprieve from human noise, pollution, hunger. Each generation dwindles in number. The world is a mirror of our hearts. Look away from human noise, pollution, hunger. Everything is endangered or going extinct. The world is a mirror of our hearts. Look away so as not to see how under the waves everything is endangered or going extinct. When orcas no longer sing, will we see? Will we see how under the waves, the waves that say hush along the beach? When orcas no longer sing, will we see how we mistook desolation for peace? So that poem uh, is written in a form called a pantoum. And it has lines that cascade throughout that repeat um, throughout the poem and it makes a full circle. And I chose this form for that poem and these next two poems as well, uh, because I wrote them for a collection of, well, it's a little book um, and it's coming out in May and it's called Northwest Know How Beaches. So. Um, I visited 29 beaches from Samiamu all the way down to Coos Bay, and I wrote about them along the way. And at the end of all of that, we still had a little bit of room to spare. And so the publisher said, do you want to write some poems? I said, heck yeah. So I wrote some poems and um, the, the pantoum form just seemed like a natural fit because, you know, at every beach, there's that repetition of waves that constant, you know, repetition that going out and coming back and going out and coming back um, and how satisfying that is. It just kind of feels like a complete circle. Um, so I chose the pantoum form and wrote these poems for that book. And this poem's called Songs on the Salmon Scale. A salmon is a song sung in rounds, a series of concentric circles, like a raindrop in the sea, rippling out and returning, a series of concentric circles, a chorus and a verse, rippling out and returning in a shining body of treasure, a chorus and a verse, a hero home from adventure in a shining body of treasure, bearing gifts from the deep, a hero home from adventure like a raindrop on the sea, bearing gifts from the deep, a salmon is a song sung in rounds. <clears throat> and I use this poem um, to talk to young people about the journey of the salmon and how oh. it, it goes out and it comes back uh, with all of these marine derived nutrients in its body that feed the entire ecosystem around it, inland, upstream, sometimes thousands of miles upstream, and how <clears throat> the result is that some of these valleys, you know, are just so very fertile from all of that, uh, from, from hundreds and thousands of years of salmon coming back and returning and feeding the entire ecosystem. So, you know, the trees and the insects and the animals all benefit from that journey of the salmon. <clears throat> I also learned something interesting, which is that a salmon scale is called a cycloid and that at the center is a focus and it has rings that circle out, they ripple out from the focus and that apparently you can tell how old a salmon is from counting the circuli, the rings that ripple out from the focus. So that was pretty cool. And uh, this next poem is called Beach Fire. Measure wealth by how well you enjoy the hours, fluttering by in praise of sunshine and the ocean breeze, whispering love songs across waves that kiss the beach. This wealth takes work and absolutely no work at all. Fluttering by in praise of sunshine and the ocean breeze. Don't mistake leisure for laziness. This gratitude is rigorous. This wealth takes work and absolutely no work at all. This gift of a moment to be alive, to feel at peace. Don't mistake leisure for laziness. This gratitude is rigorous. To be filled up and satisfied by a day at the beach. This gift of a moment to be alive, to feel at peace. It means your heart fire flames a lovely heat. To be filled up and satisfied by a day at the beach. You could toast marshmallows by that warmth. 
It means your heart fire flames a lovely heat. The glowing embers, a boundless source of power. You could toast marshmallows by that warmth, whispering love songs across waves that kiss the beach. The glowing embers, a boundless source of power. Measure wealth by how well you enjoy the hours. So I just wanted to close with that poem, primarily because um, it again speaks to a different way of understanding, like of understanding wealth and what we value. And I used to, growing up, I used to hear all the time from my mom and from my aunties and uncles that they never knew uh, or never had any reason to consider like wealth or that they were poor. Um, and I think, you know, how beautiful that must have been to be free of that. Um, I'm sure the parents were not, but as children to be free of that too, and to feel embraced by like all of the beauty that is in the world. Um, so I, I just think that there's a lot there and that those values or ways of being could really, um, to be anchored in that could really guide uh, us worldwide out of this mess um, towards out, out of this mess towards a healthier ecosystem and environment and you know everything so um, those are the poems I selected to share with you today and I'm, I'm happy to take questions for this next section of the program. Thank you so much Rena. You have a talent with words and just um, beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, we do have a, a couple of questions. Um, has poetry always been a part of your life or is it something that you, you know, more recently came into? Yeah, I've always loved poetry. I've always loved the sound of words and the, the, um, rhymes and rhythms of the natural, you know, of human speech. Do you have, uh, do you have any advice for the research community about using our voice to speak about, about the work in the Salish Sea? Yes. Um, so one thing that really uh, is, is kind of, Mm, frustrating about the way that science is done in the Western world um, versus like indigenous ways of knowing and being is that, you know, one, it only considers what can be observed, like what can actually be, you know, observed. it doesn't take into account like um, the mystery, I suppose, um, which you know, you can see it if you observe it over like several generations or several lifetimes. And there's like a continuation of oral, of oral, of an oral tradition that says this or this, and you believe it. Um, you can observe how like an activity might be detrimental to a certain species um, in that way. But you can't really observe these things in the moment under a microscope in any kind of immediate situation. And I, I'll give an example, which is that, you know, uh, in, I think it was 1863, Thomas Henry Huxley, for whom Huxley College of Environmental Sciences is named, he was the president of Britain's Royal Society. And at the Fisheries Expo that year, he was the keynote speaker. And someone asked the question, can, can, the actions of human beings have an impact on the fisheries of the earth? And his answer was, no, absolutely not. The, the resource is so vast and limitless that uh, the, the um, wealth of the sea cannot be extirpated by the agency of man. That was the answer. And as the result, it you know kind of fixed fisheries policy worldwide for over a hundred years. And it just kind of let loose the floodgates for all of these lethal technologies in the fishery that caused massive devastation worldwide. And <clears throat> it was all scientifically 
approved. <laughs> um, it was all based on what then was the best science from, you know, the best scientists in, in the world, the present, you know, and, uh, and it, it just, you know, we're going to deal with the devastation of that for generations and generations to come if we ever do recover it, um, the fishery at the level that it was. But also on the, on adding to that is that I find troubling by how science is done and how research is funded is that we fund research, scientific research um, and exploration for the purpose of being able to find resources to exploit in some way, right? Or being able to find some way for something to serve us better. Otherwise we wouldn't we wouldn't fund, it's like an investment, right? Like research and knowledge is an investment in um, expecting a return of some kind uh, that is exploitative at its core. And so I think to have science guided by funding that is, is distributed in that way and to have research that doesn't consider, you know, the unseen is, is um, short-sighted and not good. <laughs> so, so I think that that would be, I mean, it sounds crazy because I'm like a poet and I'm telling, giving advice about research, but this is, I'm also kind of speaking from like indigenous ways of knowing and being and thinking about how, uh, how, you know, things were observed for a long time and that feeling of resonance, right? That I talked to at the very beginning of the reading that I spoke of that, you know, people weren't just allowed to go out and be like, oh, well, this is what, you know, this is what I think we should do because it means we'll have like the most fish for ourselves forever. Like that was not allowed to, that was not allowed. You had to be in resonance with everybody before a thing could occur. Um, and if, if you brought something, usually some kind of elder somewhere would say, well, if you look at this and you look at this, if you do this to this, this will happen to this. And, you know, there was like an understanding about the community, like of, of the world that we live in and um, that nothing like operates in a vacuum independent of anything else. And I think that it's, uh, it's just not something that informs decision-making around science. So, okay, there's me off my soap, soapbox. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> um, well, I thank you so much for talking and speaking with us and sharing your poetry. I look forward to, to reading your new book and I'm sure everybody else on that's attending this conference does too. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone else, we'll see you in the next session. Thanks. Hi, Chef.